Uh, well, today uh, we're going to be starting off in a brand new series, and I, I am really excited about this series. We're calling it Keep It Positive. And, and kind of the idea behind this series is that there is just so much negativity in the world. Can I get a nod up and down or something right there? Have you guys noticed just how easy it is to find negativity, easy it is uh, to be cynical? I read this last night, and, and they said, we are living in a VUCA world, okay? VUCA means vo- volatility uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, a VUCA kind of world, and that leads to negativity and cynicism. It's just all over the place. You can find it everywhere you look. You can find people being negative, people being cynical. You turn on the news. What's on the news? Nothing good, right? It's just all bad news. The Dow went down 9,000 points, you know, and we're all going to die and have to eat used toilet paper. You know, and that's where it's going to go. You know, it's like you turn on the news. It's like, oh, it's politics season. Hooray. Yay. We get to have another presidential election. Isn't this exciting? It's like, didn't we just do this like four years ago? Do we really have to keep doing these things? Because it's just going to be negative, negative, negative all over the place. You look around at the community. It's like, oh, families are falling apart. You know, marriages are dissolving. Kids are disrespectful to their parents. Parents. Parents are disrespectful to their kids. And you just look around. Old people look at kids and are like, oh, kids these days. Those millennials, you know, with their vaping and their phones. And they can't have conversations without using their thumbs. And then kids look at old people like, old people these days. They keep posting the same Facebook conspiracy every week. It's like, it's not new. They can't take your photos. You already gave them to them, all right? And so it says, it's just, all this is, it's just so easy to find negativity just all over the place. And then, you know, if that isn't it, then like yesterday evening, Football season started. Yeah, yeah, it started. But how long does it take to get negative about that? If you're a Miami fan, it took one game. That's it, you know, just it. It's just like, oh my goodness. It's just like, it's so easy to just find ourselves getting negative. And here's the truth, friends. If you look for negative, if you look for things to be negative about, I promise you, you will find them. Okay, it's so easy to find the things to be negative about. There, there's no proverb. It's from Proverbs chapter 11, verse 27. This is what it says. If you search for, say it with me, if you search for good, you'll find favor. But if you search for evil, it will find you. If you look for things that are good, you're going to be able to find favor. You'll be able to find good things. But if you go out there looking for negative, if you go out there looking for evil things, that will find you. It's really the difference between a vulture and a hummingbird. I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not. Vultures, hummingbirds, both birds. And vultures are nasty. I mean, nobody likes to see a vulture or anything like that. But what do vultures do? They, they fly around with their big, ugly face and their big, ugly wings. And they circle around. And what are they doing? They're looking for dead things. I mean, that's what they're looking for. They're just circling. They, they've got incredible eyesight, and they fly over the landscape, and they're looking for dead things. If there is a vulture circling your house... It's time to move. (laughs) But that's what they're looking for, things that are dead. But a hummingbird, what does it do? It takes its little wings and it just goes around and it's just flying, 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 flying. And it flies over all these things. But what is a hummingbird looking for? Oh, it's looking for flowers or those little cool little hummingbird feeders and those things. They're looking for the sweet things of life. They're both birds. They both fly over the landscape. Both of them fly over flowers. Both of them fly over dead animals. But they only find what they are actually looking for. Four, hummingbird will fly right over the dead animal that a vulture will stop on while a vulture will fly right over a flower that the hummingbird will stop on. So here's my question. Do you want to be a vulture or a hummingbird? Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm a hummingbird. Just do that real quick. I'm a hummingbird. I want to flap my wings fast. That's what I want to do. I don't want to be a vulture. And we don't want vultures, right? That's not what we want. If you look for good, you'll find favor. But if you look for evil, it will find you. And so we're going to spend a few weeks here. I'm excited about this series. Um, we're going to spend a few weeks just talking about how we can keep it positive, how we can be positive, how we can be people who are encouraging, generous, filled with, with gratitude, enthusiasm, and, and confidence. Today, uh, today's message is just titled this, I'm optimistic. Everybody say that with me. I'm optimistic. I love this. This is so great because naturally I am an optimist. 
Okay, this is just who I am. I've had friends in my life, they've called me Pollyanna. Um, because you're like, you just see good in everything. It's like, well, you're a vulture. And so that's your problem. And so, but just, I do, I see good. I just love this. I am so optimistic as long as Missouri is not playing football. Then I am optimistic. It's, it, it, then I'm not, okay? Then I'm pessimistic. But I, I love this. And so we're talking about optimism versus pessimism. You guys know the difference between optimism and pessimism, right? An optimist sees the cup is half full. A pessimist sees it as half empty. Now, you maybe have never thought of this before, but you realize that at some point in history, some philosopher took a glass that was half full, half empty, stuck it in front of a person, and they said, what do you see? And that first person that ever said that glass is half full, we don't know what his name is. So we just refer to him as Optimist Prime. <laughs> that was for me more than anybody else, all right? So... But that's what we're talking about, optimism, 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 half full, half empty. Optimist, you know, is a guy that keeps his car running when his wife goes shopping. You know, an optimist is a guy that looks at his cup and it's overflowing. He goes, oh, God is blessing me. A pessimist says, oh, I'm going to need paper towels. You know, that, that's, that's the difference here. We're talking about being optimistic, not pessimistic. Optimism is so important because our, our, our perspective shapes our lives. They, they did a study, uh, University of California, Davis. They did a study. It was 10 weeks long. And they had three groups of people. And they said, we want you all to keep a journal. To the first group, they said, we only, you can only write down good things, positive things, things that you are grateful for. Just write those things down every day for 10 weeks. Second group, they said, you can only write down things that annoy you, that are inconvenience, inconveniences to you. You just write those things down, negative things. Third group, they said, we just want you to be objective. Just be neutral. So at the end of 10 weeks, this is probably not a surprise to you, you want to know which group was exercising more, had been to the doctor less, was just overall healthy and better than anybody else? Group one, the group that was optimistic, that was looking out, looking for things to be grateful about, looking for things that were positive. Now, why is that, why is that true? Because if you look for good, you find favor. If you look for evil, it will find you. So I am optimistic today, and I am hoping to give you some reasons why we can be optimistic as well. Now, I want to give you a disclaimer up front. Um, for those of you who want to cross your arms and you already don't like this, um, I just want to say I'm not just talking about just feel-good thinking, power-positive thinking kind of things. Though Those things work. Uh, those things can be helpful, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about an optimism based on how we feel today. The optimism that I want to pass along to you is an optimism that is based on what is true. In fact, this is how I've got it in your notes. We're not optimistic because of what we feel, but because of what God says. We're not just optimistic because we're just going to feel that way. We're going to be optimistic because of the truth of God's word. Psalm 39, 7 says, Lord, what do I look for? He says, my hope is in you. That's why we're optimistic because of what God says. So today, I'm going to give you some reasons why you can be optimistic. Now, as I was writing this this week, um, I got up to about 13, and then I just made myself stop because I was not optimistic that you would stay awake through a 13-point sermon. And so I have pulled it down uh, to five reasons from Romans 8. Um, I was hopping around this week, and I just was like, we're just going to go to Romans 8. And I'm going to give you five reasons from Romans 8. It could be 8, it could be 18, it could be 28, but I'm just going to give you five uh, today for why we can be optimistic. So um, everybody turn to your neighbor and say, I'm optimistic. Just do it real quick. I'm optimistic. Yeah. You sound pessimistic when you're saying you're optimistic. I mean, come on now, y'all. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. <laughs> These are terrible, terrible, terrible. I'm optimistic. Say it with me. I'm optimistic and say it like you mean it. All right, we're going to be in Romans chapter 8. Reason number one why we can be optimistic is this, is that God is for me, not against me. God is for me, he is not against me. Listen to how Paul puts it in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 31. This is what he says. He said, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? For he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns? No one. No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Why am I optimistic? Because I know that God is for me, not against me. 
God is on my side. He is not against me. I mean, just think about just how incredible that statement is, that the God who created this incredible playground that we call earth, the one who spoke it all into existence, the one who sustains it all with his powerful word, the one who knows when a sparrow falls from the sky, the one who knows the number of hairs on my head. He knows my name. He loves me. And he has said, I'm on your side. I am with you. I am not against you. That is an incredible, powerful truth. That feeds optimism, does it not? To know that God is for you, not against you. I was trying to think of a way to explain it. This was this is kind of what I was thinking of. My dad um, is a performer. And so the reason we had food on our table growing up is because my dad could sing. And so it started off that he was like in gospel quartets. Uh, then he did solo work and that stuff. And then um, he went to the Precious Moments Chapel in Carthage, Missouri. Has anybody ever heard of the Precious Moments Chapel in Carthage, Missouri? It's okay. You don't need to. And so, um, but he started a music show there. And then now, this is like the weirdest thing that I ever tell people. It's like, so now uh, my dad, what he does is he is a George Strait impersonator. Uh, that, that's what he does. And then he's not only George Strait, but the guy that does Alan Jackson, they get together and they are Brooks and Dunn as well. And so I have an interesting background. How about that? And so, but it was really, it's really kind of my, my, my dad doing that gave me access to things that other people didn't get. I could go to my dad's concerts. I could go to the shows that my dad was in charge of. And even as a kid, I could walk backstage. And pe nobody else can walk backstage. People be there like, no, no, you can't go back there. I could walk up on stage, not during the show, but you know, after the show, and I could, walk, I could go back to the sound booth. I could walk around that place, and anytime somebody would be like, hey, 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 you can't go there, I'd be like, I'm Larry Turner's son. And they'd be like, oh, well then, by all means. Because my dad was in charge. You know, my, my dad was the boss. He was the boss at the Precious Moments Music Show. So I had access to do these kind of things. All I had to do was say his name. And it put to bed any of those accusations that I was doing something I shouldn't be doing. It put to bed any of those, you know, barriers that were right there in front of me. It got rid of all of them. Why? Because my dad, my dad was the boss. And here's the great news. Our heavenly father says the same thing about you, that whenever accusations are thrown against you, whenever you're trying to go where he's leading you and you're, you're bumping up against those roadblocks and people are like, no, 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 you can't do that. All you gotta do is say, uh, my dad... My dad is the one who holds all things together. My dad is the one who is above all things. My dad is the one who says no accusation should stand against you. My dad is the one who says no weapon formed against you shall stand. My God is for me, not against me. I'm optimistic that I'm going to be able to make it through whatever is in front of me. Can I get an amen on that? I mean, that's exactly right. Our God is for us, not against us. The second reason is this, is that God works for good in all things. And out to the side, I just wrote this. My pain isn't wasted. My pain is not wasted. Listen to what Paul says in verse 28. He says these words, and we know that in, and say it with me, that in all things. Now, you catch that. It's all things. That's good things, bad things, medium things, mundane things, monumental things, all things. God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You want to know why I'm optimistic? Is because my pain's not going to be wasted. And everything that I endure in this life, everything that I face, everything that we, we, we face, that even though we may not understand everything, even though we may not enjoy everything, that we can know that our God who loves us that it will pass through his hands and he will do something good with that. That our greatest disappointments can become our greatest blessings. Uh, Joseph is in the Old Testament, book of Genesis. F fantastic just story about his life. He's his daddy's favorite. Daddy gives him a really cool coat. Um, his brothers get really jealous. They want to kill him, but they don't, so they sell him into slavery. And while he's in slavery, he works himself up to the top to where he's his, employee, his, his boss's best employee. But then his boss's wife accuses him of trying to rape her, and so he ends up thrown in jail, starts off at the bottom in jail, works himself all the way up to where they're actually entrusting the prison to Joseph, um, but they forget about him, that he's there. Then finally Pharaoh has a dream, and, and Joseph goes and he interprets that dream, and he gets set out, and, and Pharaoh puts him at number two in the entire kingdom. He says, the only person whose word is better than yours is mine, Okay. 
And there's this great big famine that's going on in the land. And so Joseph is the one that kind of plans and he makes, makes all the, the right plans so that people will survive. And at the very end of Genesis, it's fascinating. His brothers are there, the ones who sold him into slavery, who set him off onto this course, and their dad is dead. And so they're just terrified that Joseph, their powerful brother, is going to just kill them now because of what they did to him. And he looks at his brothers, and he looks at them. And in Genesis 50, this is what he says. He said, wait, you intended to harm me. God intended for good, and that many lives would be saved. See, our greatest disappointments can be a source of our greatest blessings. You know this to be true because you were dating that guy and you thought that, oh my goodness, this is going to be the one. He is the one. But he didn't maybe treat you the way he should have treated you. And so that relationship ended and you were just crushed. You were heartbroken. But then you married somebody else and you just married way up and he treats you so much better. He treats you like the princess that you deserve to be treated like. You had that house that you're just like, oh, this is the one, this is the white picket fence, the 3.2 kids and the other, the, the dog and a half of a cat. And it's like, this is exactly what we want and this is what we want. You, you put in the offer and, and, and it's just like, that, that's, this is the one and then it falls through. But then God leads you to something better. Or, you know, or you've got this job, it's right there and it's like, this is the job, this is the one, it's my dream job and your dream gets crushed but then God sends something else along. Our greatest disappointments can be the greatest blessings. We know this to be true. We, we know that what the devil intends for evil, God can use for good. And we know that God doesn't cause these things, but he can use these things. We know that whatever passes through his hands will be used for our good. That God is in the business of taking wrong turns and turning them into right things. God is the one. We may not always get what we hope for, but the one we hope in will never fail us. We can be optimistic that our pain will not be wasted. Number three, we can be optimistic because our future victory is greater than our present pain. What we have in store for us is better than what we experience right now. Listen to what Paul says in verse 18. He says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. What we are facing now just pales in comparison to what it is that God has for us in front of us. And as we face suffering, we can be optimistic. We can have hope to know that our current circumstances don't define our future circumstances. So I was trying to think of how to explain this one. And so um, if you've been around for a little bit, you know I am a huge Kansas City Chiefs football fan, okay? That's like the greatest team in the world. And so that, that's my team. I'm going to tell you all, it's been a rough go being a Chiefs fan. We haven't won a Super Bowl in over 50 years, which is still one more than the Falcons have won. We haven't won, I mean, it's been forever. And I have lived through some just awful quarterback play. Just awful. I mean, I remember the days of Bill Kenny, Steve DeBerg, Steve Bono, Elvis Gerback. We had Joe Montana for, for a little bit, but he was collecting social security at that point. Doesn't really count. Tyler Thigpen, Tyler Palco, Matt Castle. And now we have Patrick Mahomes, the MVP of the league. He is in head and shoulders commercials, y'all. He is just, he is a chief. And I, if I could go back to 10-year-old me and just go, Adam, the pain that you are suffering right now pales in comparison to the future of glory that will be yours in Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> Might be a little much, all right? But, but still, you got me, you tracking with me. That what Paul is saying is like all these things that you're going through right now, as you look towards the future, as you look at to what's ahead of you, as you look at to what God has, has promised you, they pale in comparison. Because remember, you're going to have this place that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can imagine the riches that God has in store for you. You're going to have the land of no more, no more tears, no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, no more, no more disagreements, no more misunderstandings. You're going to have the presence of God forever and ever and ever and ever. And it's going to be fantastic. And he's like, I know it might be terrible right now, but your present sufferings, they pale in comparison to the future glory that is yours in Christ Jesus. You can be optimistic today because what is coming for you and what is, what you are, what is in store for you is so much better. Remember, it'll be more, not less. And you can even dare to hope or imagine. Be optimistic about your future. Number four, 
I'm optimistic because nothing can separate me from God's love. Not a thing. Romans 8, verse 38, Paul says it this way. He says, for I am convinced. It's like, I'm, I'm convinced. This isn't just like a, you know, like just a fleeting thought. This isn't just something that it's just like, ah, oh, that'd be nice. It's like, I'm convinced. I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels nor demons, the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor debt, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing. Nothing, not a thing can separate us. Every terrifying thing this world can produce, everything's in there. Did you catch it? Demons, angels, height, nor death, um, nothing else, you know, life, nor death. The only thing that's not in there is cats. It's the only thing that's not in there. But nothing, not the worst that this world, world can throw at us. He's like, nothing can separate us from, this, from the love of God. Dead, alive, nothing, 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 nothing cannot separate it. And this love is not just a, a now love, it's a forever love, no matter what's going on in you, around you, or to you. God's love is never going to leave you. He is never going to forsake you. And so we can be optimistic because he loves us. No matter where we go, no matter what I do, no matter what happens, he is there for me. I'm optimistic because nothing can separate me from God's love. Isn't that good news? That's great news. So why are we optimistic? Before I give you the last one, let's just kind of review real quick. Because God's for us, he's not against us. God's on our side. No weapon formed against us is going to stand. God works for good in all things. Our pain's not wasted. It's because our future victory is greater than our present pain. And because nothing can separate us from God's love. But you want to know the big reason why you can be optimistic today? It's because of this. My sins are forgiven. Doesn't that feel good to say? My sins are forgiven. Listen to how Paul starts this chapter off. Everything that we've been reading so far hinges from this statement that he says here, starting off in verse one. He says, therefore, there is now no, say this word with me, there is no condemnation. Doesn't that feel good to say? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. That's what God did. We have no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. Because this is how I wrote it down in my notes. God condemned sin, not me. He condemned sin, but he did not condemn me. Now, were there reasons for me to be condemned? Oh, you betcha. Are there reasons for God to condemn you? You betcha. I mean, we are all, we're not mistakers, right? You understand this. We don't just make mistakes. We are sinners, we are people who don't do what is right, and we are people who do what is wrong. That is who we are, every single one of us. We have all done this, and so we, there is every right. God has every right in his holiness and in his power to just say, you know what, I'm going to condemn all y'all, but instead, he doesn't do that. And what I love about this is that God just doesn't look the other way. You notice that? It doesn't say, and so God just looked past our sin. You know, kind of like whenever, it's like, he did, not like at your house, whenever somebody puts the toilet paper on backwards, and you're just like, all right, I'm just going to look past this one right now. Or, you know, or somebody leaves a sock on the floor, and it's like, okay, I'm just going gonna, gonna to look past that one. Or, or they, they fold a shirt inside out instead of right side out. It's like, okay, I'm going to look past that. That's not what it says that God did. He doesn't just look past our sins. He doesn't do that. He dealt with our sins, and he does this by sending Jesus to die for us. And so we're not condemned because Jesus was condemned for us. Whenever he died on the cross, he condemned the sin that was killing us. So why am I optimistic? Because I've been set free. 
I've been set free from all that condemnation. I, there's no condemnation there for me. And why can you be optimistic? Because you've been set free. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You can be, you are, you have been set free in Jesus Christ. No matter how you feel in this moment, you can be certain that if you have put your hope and your faith and your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone, if you have done that, you can know that you have not been content. You can know that as far as the east is from the west, so he is so far as he removed our transgressions from us and how did he do that he did that through the cross through Jesus's brutal death but Jesus didn't just stay dead he was buried but because he loves us so much he was raised from the dead he defeated death and he defeated anything that could lay claim to us and because of that we have hope no matter how dark our past no matter how dark no matter how negative no matter what we have been forgiven and friends that's something worth being excited about that's something worth being optimistic about in fact somebody say I'm optimistic say it with me I'm optimistic we're optimistic why? Because God is for us, not against us. That Our pain isn't going to be wasted. Our future victory is greater than our present struggle. Nothing can separate us from God, and our sins are forgiven. Listen, we're not optimistic because we are good, but because he is good. Okay, We're not optimistic because of what we feel, but because of what he says, and what he says is what matters. Bottom line this morning is this. What we hope for is based on who we hope in. What we hope for is based on the one we hope in. And so our hope, our optimism can live because Jesus lives. We are optimistic, not pessimistic. Not because of what we feel, but because of what God says. So God, today we're asking that these things would live in us and that we would know this truth and that we would allow this truth to shape our lives and that it would cause us to go to look for things that are good and to find favor and to not search for evil and for it to find us. Oh God, thank you for being a good God who loves us, who has spoken these things over us and so much more. And may we hold on to them dearly. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.